Hi, I'm the Casual Spaceman and welcome to my channel once again. Yes, I'm back. I'm feeling better, I'm feeling stronger, I'm feeling positive and I'm back with a vengeance with this video. And I think this is going to probably going to be the best video that I've made in terms of the information that it provides. So first of all, before I go ahead, I just want to thank my Patreons. Thank you very, very much for your support. It means a great deal to me and it allows me to do what I love doing. And that's entertaining you and providing information for you and my subscribers. So what's this video about? Well, recently I was watching a debate on Jose's channel and a guy called John Peake or John Leake, I believe, said that uh, NASA are buying up all the, most of the helium reserves in the world in order to keep all the satellites on balloons. Because as, as we know, a lot of flat earthers make the claims that satellites are all worked by balloons or kept up in the atmosphere by balloons. Well, I'm going to make this video to get to the bottom of this and reveal the truth to you once and for all. So without further ado, let's cue the music and get stuck in. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, Okay, so what's the claim? There's two parts to this claim. First of all, one. Flat Earthers are claiming that the satellites that we see, that we observe, are all kept aloft by balloons, helium balloons. And the number two claim is that NASA are buying up most of the world's helium reserves in order to keep these satellites in orbit. Okay, so well, let's have a look at it. First of all, I wanted to find out exactly what is helium. So as we can see from this explanation, um, helium is a chemical element with the symbol HE and atomic number two. It is colorless, odorless, tasteless, non-toxic, inert, and that's the most important thing I want you to remember. Inert gas is a gas that does not undergo chemical reactions under, some, uh, under set of given conditions. The noble gases often did not react with many substances and were historically referred to as the inert gas. So an inert gas, in other words, doesn't burn, it won't explode, and it doesn't react with most chemicals and most elements. Um, so it's a very safe gas to use in that respect. It's a monatomic gas, um, as you can see from this explanation. In physics and chemistry, uh, monatomic is a combination of two words, mono and atomic which means a single atom. So it consists of a single atom. Um, and it's the first gas in the noble gas group on the periodic table. Um, so we see from the periodic table, there it is over in the right hand corner amongst group 18 of the noble gases. And it's the first one on the top of that list. Okay, so that's what helium is. So what I wanted to do was find out, well, who, which country or who is producing uh, or obtaining most of the helium gases around the world. Well, as we can see by far, the United States at 55%, then followed by Qatar in the Middle East at 32%. And the next, uh, next available then is Algeria at 6%. So if we look at these two countries alone, 87% of helium reserves or helium being produced is at these two countries. Okay, so then I wanted to find out, well, we know that there has been a helium um, shortage in recent years. So why is this? And I did a little bit of research and I found this article uh, from Al Jazeera, Al Jazeera, beg your pardon. Um, and it says here, helium is one of the most abundant elements in the universe forming about 23% of all matter. It becomes a liquid at the lowest boiling point of, of any element, but because it is lighter than air, most of it escapes into the atmosphere before it can be captured, making it a rare commodity in, scientific, in science today. So when Qatar, the second largest helium supply in the world, as we saw here, uh, shut down its two helium plants, following uh, the severing of diplomatic and economic ties with Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain. 
The industry went into a panic, fearing a helium shortage, which is exactly what happened, at least for a while anyway. Qatar can meet 32% of the total, total global demand for helium, as we've already seen, according to the United States Geological Survey, and without this supply, medicine, spacecraft, and even birthday parties could be affected. Qatar has been exporting helium through its port with Saudi Arabia but was forced to shut down its plants after the border was closed. They have since started exporting the gas through Oman and the market has become stable again. But as we can see, clearly, having two countries producing 84%, 87%, I beg your pardon, of the world's helium production, it really does lead to a, a very unstable market, which is exactly what happened where you had another country who had several diplomatic ties with several other countries around them uh, so they weren't uh, able to sell and export um, helium so uh, a third of the world's supplies automatically just shut down at least for a short period of time so therefore producing a shortage for a while at least so the claim that NASA the reason why there was a uh, a shortage of helium because NASA was buying up all the supplies so far up to this point doesn't really add up but there's still more so I wanted to find out what exactly uh, is helium mostly used for and on this same article I found this so there's helium and the main uses 20% on MRI scanners I didn't know that 17% on welding, 10% on laboratories, 8% on balloons. Now granted, it doesn't specify what kind of balloons these are used for, this 8%. 6% on pressurizing, remember that one. 6% on fiber optics, didn't know that. 5% on leak detection, 4% on other cryogenics, 4% on electronics, 3% on controlled atmosphere, 3% on breathing, and 14% of various other, other uses. So very surprising. So, okay. If NASA are buying up all these things, and most of the helium reserves, that really doesn't add up either, does it? Because if you can see from MRI scanners, welding and laboratories alone, that adds up, what, to 27, 47%, nearly half of the types of uses that are being used for around the world. MRI scanners, welding and laboratories. Again, it's not really adding up that NASA would be buying up most of the helium reserves. Just doesn't add up. Okay, so let's look at 8% of balloons. Let's just say for argument's sake that 8% of balloons are being used for these so-called satellites or the satellites that are being kept up, up in the air by helium balloons. Okay, so to support any evidence, um, as you can see from the bottom of this graphic, the sources of the USGS, which is the uh, US Geological Survey, um, which is a scientific agency of the US government, um, and also Helium One. Um, and on the website, you'll see some supporting evidence of what the uh, different uses we are for. Um, and also, uh, if you go onto the USG webs GS websites, um, under Helium Statistics of Information, there's lots of different documents that support those statistics that I've just gone through. Okay, so there's a claim that uh, helium is being used to keep satellites up in the sky. Well, exactly how many satellites are orbiting the Earth in 2019? Well, this is a website I found from Pixelytics um, and it does have some supporting links um, so um, I'll provide all the links to everything that I've used so far in this video. Uh, once, I, once the premiere has, um, has finished, I will then update the, uh, the description below the video with all the links that I've used. So you're welcome to click on those links and uh, check the, my information um, if you wish. So as it says here, this is our update on the satellites carrying orbiting the Earth uh, at the start of 2019. How many satellites are orbiting the Earth? So according to the Index of Objects Launched into Outer Space, uh, maintained by the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, there were four 
uh, 4,987 uh, sorry 4,987 satellites orbiting the planet at the start of the year an increase of 2.68 percent compared to the end of April 2018 so um, as you mentioned the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs um, it's an index of uh, uh, objects launched into outer space and uh, here they are now this is the United Nations and as we know flat earthers love the United Nations map, don't they? Um, and United Nations Register of Objects Launched to Outer Space. Since 1962, the United Nations has maintained a register of objects launched into outer space. Originally established as a mechanism to the aid uh, the United Nations Committee on Peaceful Uses of Outer Space in its discussions on the political, legal and technical issues concerning outer space. The evolution of the uh, international space law results in space object registration becoming a means of identifying which states bear international responsibility and liable for space objects. Okay, so let's go back and we'll look at a little bit more information. So, UNICEF recorded 382 objects launched into space during 2018, which is 15.67 lower than the 453 objects launched in 2017. I won't read the whole thing here, but just the key key paragraphs. According to USA, in the history, uh, in history, a total of 8,378 objects have been launched into space. Currently, 4,994 are still in orbit, although seven of them are still in orbit around the celestial bodies other than the Earth, meaning there are 4,987 satellites whizzing around the um, around above our heads every single day. 4,987. I'm sure you forgive me if we just round that up to 5,000. I mean, it's 13 difference. So I'm um, so it's 5,000 satellites orbiting the Earth at the moment. So again, does really NASA buying up helium in order to keep all those satellites whizzing above our head? Does that stack up? I think not so far. It's looking pretty grim for that claim, isn't it? So if you look at the table here, again, you can look at this at your leisure and it gives you the idea of uh, all these different satellites that were launched through the ages, starting from 1957 to. And if we look at the recent years in particular of note, 2006, uh, 2016 went to 221. Then all of a sudden there was a huge jump in 2017 of 453. Um, I should imagine it's the uh, result of the now popular CubeSats. Uh, CubeSats are very, very small satellites, um, inexpensive to produce, um, and you can actually launch uh, lots of them um, in one rocket launch, um, often called uh, ride share uh, or satellite share or payload share, um, which makes it much cheaper for people to actually launch satellites. Um, there was a little bit of a drop in 2018, but I suspect with SpaceX, Okay, um, and the uh, recent Starlink system being launched. A lot, a lot more of those are going to be launched over the coming year. So I should imagine that 2019 figure will be much, much higher, probably higher than 2017, I suspect. Um, but as it says here, the next 10 years will be interesting. It's likely that the same level of recent growth has been maintained. But equally, there will be a significant number of satellites being launched each year. The UK government last summer uh, forecast that there will be 2,000 small satellites launched by 2030. 2,000. Wow. Okay, so it goes on to say, where have all these objects in space been launched from? There are 31 different launch facilities listed in uh, by UNUSA uh, as having put objects into space, including a number of air-based, sea-based, and even submarine-based launches. The most used sites on these, don't forget, these are just sites at the moment, uh, they've been launched for. Um, the, you've got the um, Pleslex Cosmodrome in Russia, 2,101 launches. Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, again for Russia, 1,734. So from Russia alone, there's 3,835 launches. 3,834 la 35 launches. Cape Canaveral in the United States, 1,203. Vandenberg Air Force Base in the uh, United States, 1,103. So if you compare that in the United States, uh, that's what, uh, 2,306 launches compared to what Russia have actually launched. 
and then you've got French Guiana, uh, where uh, various other people launch um, satellites from, at 510 launches. So how many of these orbiting satellites are actually working? Uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, UCS, keeps a record of operational satellites and their latest updates provide details at the end of 2018. Using this database with the UN uh, um, sorry, UNERSA index shows that there are currently 1,957 active satellites in orbit. So even with those active ones, nearly 2,000 active satellites apparently being kept up by helium. Apparently. Really not adding up at the moment, is it at all? It just doesn't seem to correspond with reality, what they claim which represents just under 40% of the satellites orbiting the planet. Interestingly, this is also 1.16 lower than the last update of this database for April 2018. Just a little bit of information, more modern satellites now are having, have actually got um, deorbit capability. Um, so when they come to the end of their natural lives, uh, they automatically deorbit themselves um, and 95% of the material will just burn up in the atmosphere. And as we know, satellites are getting smaller and smaller, particularly with the advent now of uh, the most commonly used CubeSats. Um, so the materials that we used, you know, is getting, it hopefully should improve. In effect, this means that we are now 3,030, uh, I think it means lumps of metal flying around the earth, uh, flying around the earth at thousands of miles per hour doing absolutely nothing. It should be noted the United Nations have 72 satellites listed as having launched in December 2018 after the US database was last updated. However, for the rest of this section, we use the US uh, CS figures constantly. Um, so what are a lot of these satellites being used for? Communication, 777. Earth observation, 710. Technology development demonstration, 223 satellites. Navigation and positioning, 137 satellites. Space science observation. 85 satellites, Earth Science 25 satellites. Wow, that's a lot of balloons, isn't it? A lot of balloons, really. Really just not adding up at all at the moment. Okay, who uses the satellites directly? The four categories used in the previous section of that. 848 satellites are listed as having commercial uses. Now, that's one thing to actually note here. Commercial users, okay? 540 with uh, government users, 422 with military uses, and 147 with civil users as well. Okay, so again, <laughs> if NASA are really buying all this helium to keep all these satellites, and according to the official statistics, as we said, saw early on, whoops, let's go to the right page, 6%, sorry, 8% balloons. But look at these still, there they are, the biggest users of helium. Nothing to do with balloons or satellites whatsoever. Okay, so what would NASA actually be using helium for? Yes, they would use helium for balloons because they do launch lots of different thing, uh, balloons for lots of different reasons. A lot to do with uh, weather forecasting as well to help to uh, forecast the weather for particular launches they do that all the time but not only NASA but all the launch capable companies and organizations do that all the time because they need to monitor the high level winds etc for launches to make them safe okay so another reason that NASA use helium is in pressure fed engines or pressure fed tanks so as we see from here the pressure fed, pressure -fed engine is a class of rocket engine designs. A separate gas supply, usually helium, pressurizes the propellant tanks to force fuel and oxidizer to, com to the combustion changer chamber to main adequate flow. The tank pressures must, must exceed the combustion chamber pressure. Okay, so as we see from this diagram, over the right hand side here, let me just close that down. It feeds the, uh, feeds the helium into the pressure tanks in order to keep the pressure up to go to the combustion chamber. Some rockets use a, uh, a pump, a turbo pump, but in a lot of cases they use pressure, pressurized tanks in order to get the right amount of uh, fuel, oxidizer and fuel to go to the combustion chamber of the rocket in order for it to work. 
So that's one use. So what else would they use it for? Purging. Uh, in fire and explosion, ex explosion prevention engineering, purge, purging refers to the production, uh, sorry, introduction of an inert gas. As we said before, uh, helium is an inert gas. Uh, purge gas into a closed system, e.g. a container or process vessel, to prevent the formation of uh, ignitable uh, atmosphere. Purging relies on the principle that a combustible gas is able to undergo combustion only if mixed with air in the right proportions. The flammage limits of the defined gas proportions are the, next, the ignitable range. So what they often use um, helium for is to purge uh, tanks at launch sites and purge uh, gas lines to clear out any uh, remaining um, oxidizer or fuel. And because helium is inert, it's not going to react, and it pushes any remaining gas or liquids out of the out of the uh, tanks and out of the lines. So that's another reason why they use them. Again, not really adding up, is it, for what the flat earthers are claiming? Okay, so also as well, they seem to get this impression that NASA are responsible for all the satellites being launched. But in reality, there's a lot of private companies out there that are actually launching satellites, as we know, particularly with SpaceX or quite a lot in the news recently as well. So I did a little bit more research. I want to look into a uh, list of private space flight, flight companies that are launching. So. Uh, there's lots of here manufacturers of space vehicles, uh, crew, crew transport vehicles. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, launch vehicle manufacturers. Um, and we keep going down, keep going down. Landers, rovers, and orbital orbiters, research craft and tech demonstrators, propulsion manufacturers, and here we are satellite launchers. Now, this is just some of them because they haven't listed all of them. And we've got some of them here as well. Uh, Antrix Corporation, Ariane Space, um, some of them are, as we see from here, some of them are privately owned, some of them are partially privately owned, and some of them are public owned. Um, so as we see, Antrix Orbit, Ariane Space, partial minority owned by EU states. Um, Euro, uh, Euro Rocket Launch Services, 49% uh, owned by Russia and 51% um, by Kazakhstan. Uh, Glad Cosmos, uh, that's which is owned by Russia. Um, IHA Corporation, um, that's private, uh, with some research uh, R&D by JAXA, the uh, Japanese Space Agency. International Launch Services, Proton Rocket, uh, no, it's not privately owned, it's 51% owned by Russia. ISC uh, Cosmotrus, um, uh, owned by Russia and Ukraine and Kazakhstan. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, they're a private company, they produce uh, rockets in Japan, um, a lot for uh, JAXA. Northrop Grumman, um, Antares and, Min and uh, yeah, Minotaur, partially owned uh, launches funded by NASA. Rocket Lab, Electron, yes, completely privately owned company. Um, they launch a lot of their vehicles um, from New Zealand. SpaceX, of course, Falcon 9 and the Falcon Heavy, yes, all privately owned. And they produce their own uh, vehicles and their own rockets. Sea Launch, uh, or PG Zenit, yep, privately owned. Uh, Starsem, uh, Soyuz, 25% uh, owned by Russia, 25% on Samara, 35% uh, ELE Space Transportations, and 50% by the EU. United Launch Alliance, yes, 50% owned by Lockheed Martin and 50% by Boeing, uh, which produced the Atlas V and the Atlas IV Heavy. Uh, United Launch Alliance um, actually launch, uh, have the biggest market share of uh, commercial satellite launches at the moment. So as we can see, there's a lot more companies out there that are actually launching, producing spacecraft and launching satellites than NASA are. In fact, NASA don't launch that many satellites really compared to the commercial market. Okay, what about space agencies? Well, a lot of people seem to think that um, NASA are the biggest space agency. Well, they probably are the biggest in terms of they've been going the longest um, and they've certainly done a lot more than a lot of space agencies. But there's a lot more space agencies out there than people think. 
as we can go through some of them, I'll tell you what, they, these are a lot of just a whole load of different countries that have space agencies. Some of them um, have launch capabilities, some of them has astronauts, um, some of them operate satellites, some of them don't, um, and so on and so forth. But let's scroll down, go past all these countries with all these space agencies. And let's go down to list of space agencies with launch capabilities. Australian Space Agency, China. Now the China National Space Administration, European Space Agency, ESA, of course. Iranian Space Agency, Israeli Space Agency, Italian Space Agency, National Aerospace Development Administration for North Korea. The Korean Space Research Institute for South Korea. Um, ISRO for India. JAXA, Japan. And of course, NASA, big bad NASA. Please excuse me if I can't pronounce that, but CNS, C, sorry, CNES for France, Ukraine, and Russia, and of course the now defunct um, ex Soviet Union, and the uh, recently formed United States Space Force or USSF. So, really, stop blaming NASA for everything, really. So, it really does not add up. So, what can we conclude from this? There are simply too many satellites to maintain the amount of helium required to keep them in orbit, even if they are held up by helium balloons as many flat others claim. Two, the statistics of the type of use of helium doesn't add up to NASA buying or using most of it. Three, NASA is not responsible for all or even most of the satellites currently in orbit. And four, there is no evidence for these claims and in fact their claims go against readily available data for everyone to see. So we can only conclude one thing. In reality, our claims are nonsense. Well, that's about all from me. And I hope you've enjoyed watching this video as much as I've made uh, enjoyed making it. And I particularly enjoyed the research because I've learned a few things and I hope you have too. So if you like the video, please like below. And if you haven't done so already, please hit the subscribe button hit the bell icon and then you'll be notified when I upload more videos. And if you'd like to comment below as well. And if you want to comment below and tell me that I'm wrong, don't just tell me that I'm wrong, prove that I'm wrong. Bring some empirical evidence, some reliable data that we can all look at and prove it to me. Well, until then, well, thank you very much for watching. I'm the Casual Spaceman, signing out. Ten, nine.